not plugged in or your lamp is alone. Maybe we'll be, if you turn the microphone um, sideways, you'll see on the bottom of the access port to replace your lamp. Most of the microscopes that we order for people or we can tell you where to order them and how to order the lights that they might have when wear out. So clean the glass there on your condenser. So you have your material with this knob over on the left hand side so the condenser comes down. And then I'm going to go up to the top of that condenser and clean that big piece of glass so it's nice and clean. And I don't have any residual lint or dirt or anything else. Being gentle, don't press on the hard. Just clean it nice and gently. And then I'm going to rack that condenser back up to its highest point. You know, you're not pushing real hard, you're just gentle, finger tight. Now I'm going to go up here and clean my eyepieces and know that your eyepieces come off. So it's maybe real easy for you to, to clean this. And clean the other one. You want to leave the microscope open to dusty, dirty air as little as possible. Because it's when dust gets down in the middle of your microscope, then you're going to have to take it to somebody to clean it. You do not want to be getting your fingers, you know, swabs or anything else inside the um, glass parts where all the lenses and stuff are. All of these lenses are treated with anti dust coatings. And if you swab them, if you want to um, pull something wet across them, you disturb that anti dust coating and it's all just the streaks. Don't do it. Take this to a microscope service. So it's a problem you have to call one of the local hospitals and find out when they're having a microscope service. And you just bring your microscope in and they'll service it along with theirs typically. Where do you find them? Um, I just kept some of those baby um, swabs. Yeah. Wipes and, and that's perfectly good. Um, only because uh, it's just the alcohol um, works on here. Nothing really um, that will dissolve your glass. It will dissolve the glue that seeps your lenses in it. So a light cleaner. Um, alcohol works really well. You can reach if you have to, but it will get the bleach off of there pretty rapidly. Um, or you tend to get, um, chew up the glue around it. Same thing, I had to go through and you know, very gently clean my um, lenses on my uh, eyepieces, on my, me, my objective lenses. So just really gently with your, um, not a lot of pressure in your nose on most of these lenses. When you push on them, they push in because they need to protect them themselves from being broken. If you accidentally push this such that as you turn it, it runs into your slide. You want that lens to be tracked. If you look at a microscope like this, it's probably close to a thousand dollars. The most expensive part of this microscope is the one on the X lens. So this all by itself is probably four or five hundred dollars. The forty X lens is next. And so these lenses are the things you want to protect the most. So you know, the body of the microscope is probably only a hundred bucks. So just <coughs> gently wipe those and you're going to need to dab them dry just to make sure that any of that material is off the surface and just dab. First thing I'm always going to do is dial in my lowest magnification. You can tell your lowest magnification because it's the shortest lens. There's the least amounts of lenses in here, so it's the least expensive lens. And then the next one is uh, 10x. You can usually tell on the side, it tells you right there. 10x, 40x, this has a 100x, but I'm not going to use it because we're going to see everything we want to see at the um, 40x lens. Now, in my first slides, I got silicone. These are plastic slides. You'll see what's happening with my um, slide holder. Is this plastic slide goes right underneath your slide holder? So I can't really move my sample around very successfully. You know, as well, I'll be moving this and the clip that's holding that slide and there slides off and, and I can't control where my slide is going. So let me strongly suggest to you that you buy nothing made in China. Yeah, I say they be very cheap, but they're plastic. Um, same thing with uh, cover strips. Um, they are plastic. 
you really, the glass that proves your ability to see so much. So, um, no, most microscopes are not made in China. I guess they just don't have the quality. Most microscopes are actually made in Germany. Um, and so most of them are German lenses, as those guys are the most precise. U.S. fake is the next. Um, so you get all my microscopes that we recommend that make either in the U.S. or um, the main U.S. and then handled by a Canadian dealer because right, it's cheaper. Okay, so my um, sample. What I did with my sample was uh, before we had any you're going to measure that. So I think what I'm going to want to do is um, open up one of these syringes. And if you would, measure out your soil up to the one level on this syringe. And then dump it back out. So I think you're not going to have much soil going through that little tiny opening. So get your soil, whatever it might be, and with a little spoon. Grab we'll some spoons from the lunchroom, and uh, or just with your fingers, uh, put the soil in here until it reaches the one. Then we're tapping it, so you're not getting a lot of air volume. We want one cubic millimeter of your sample, whether it's liquid or whether it's solid. We want it to get to the one, and then dump that into one of these big test tubes, and you may have to rinse it out with a little bit of water. Um, and then we've got another syringe here that we can just use with water. And so you can pull up, you have to get a, a, a bigger pan or something, because it's not fitting. So with this, there's one of my four regions today, um, pull up enough water to bring it. Syringes. 
Well, I was going to take the here and sign another one because the person would be tamping that. Another one. Yeah. So just to start before waste, um, just clean the syringe out. So the next sample isn't going to get messed up. One squirt to one. Yeah, typically. I like to do three sometimes, but that was a very dirty sample. So now I'm like, I have my sample on there. I want to stick the edge of my cover slip in here and kind of do and then drop, so I just move my drop back and forth across my slide and I'll spread it out. And then I'm going to just allow that cover slip to drop on my slide and uh, get the water nice and uniform underneath that cover slip. That's just amazing. Really interesting. That didn't work too well. So I had to actually physically move that cover slip across so that the water would come underneath that cover slip evenly. And but now you can see that that plastic cover slip is really nicely held there. Nice uniform film of my sample all the way across. And then that's what goes on my uh, microscope slide. Trying to get it so that the edge of this. There we go. Now we're going to start looking. So, first step is to make sure my lowest magnification is dialed in. I rack my stage to the highest position. And so, the coarse focus are the big knobs on the outside. You can see it moves my stage a lot. And so, right at first, I want to make sure it's the smallest um, objective in there. Because when I rack that stage to the top, I don't want to be smacking my sample into my um, objective. So the 4x objective is what I have here. And so now I'm going to look through here and I'm going to focus down with that course focus. And amazingly enough, it's right at the highest setting for my 4x lens. And I go along with that fine focus of the smaller inner knob to. So lots of flagellates, it has to be pretty aerobic. So 
focus on that edge and that piece of paper. So when a little red light, red light is pointy, thank you, David, for whoever you did. Um, so see how I've gotten it and sharpened focus, so there's a little longer focus. Here it comes, nice and focused. And then I go over focus. I want to go right there where it's nice and sharpest. Now I've maximized my ability to resolve everything in this picture. And you'll notice that it's easier for everything to be really sharp and crisp. So now, the dancer is focused, my eyeballs are focused. Now I'm ready to go up to my highest magnification. So here I go. Now you'll notice that as you dial your 40 depth subjective in here, you're going to be going, I think it's going to hit. Oh no, I think it's going to hit. So be watching to make sure it doesn't actually hit. And you'll notice you've got like, <coughs> There is a little bit of space between your objective and your sample. So it can be quite scary. Do this. Now I'm going to adjust my, my um, iris diaphragm just a little bit to try to maximize. And you can see we have a whole bunch of points here. Sorry, where did you guys say where did you focus it? On the light source. The light source. Because we got to focus our light source on your sample. So you put that piece of paper over your light source so you can focus it. So you can focus So now we're looking at our sample. You can see all kinds of things that are just kind of every time we hit the table. So you attempt, especially when you're on you know, tables that are not really solid like this, Attempt not to be hitting other people's tables. Not too bad on the floor. You've got a nice solid floor. So people walking around aren't going to be making much difference. It's just going to be when you hit the tables. So try to avoid putting your elbows down real hard and things like that. So now we can be exploring our sample. There's one more thing we can do to make this a really optimal experience for your eyeballs. And that's to get both of your eyes at the same level of focus. So with my eye pieces, I'm going to do one more little bit of work. You'll notice most of the time with your eye pieces, there's going to be one eye piece that has a focusing ability on it. With your other eye piece, um, typically it doesn't have uh, an ability to focus as one does. Okay. So you're going to set your right eye piece that focusing on, you're just going to set it someplace. And so typically people are going to you know, just always set it. You know, there's a nice little line over here on this side. And so set it at you know, 60 or set it at 65. Just pick a place to put it. And now you're going to close your other eye. And you're going to focus on something in here. Just as sharp and clear as you possibly can. And you're going to memorize what that looks like. Because now we're going to close that eye and we're going to use the focusing mechanism on our other eye piece to focus that in just as sharp and as clear as it can. Both of my eyes are in the same way of focus. If you do this, you will prevent yourself from getting massive headaches. So, when your eyes, when one eye is at this plane of focus and the other eye is at this plane of focus, your eye mind is constantly trying to bring them together and it just it keeps working and it keeps, and will you end up with a headache? Oh, and a killer headache too. So, close one eye, I don't care which one, and set the other eye piece at whatever it happens to be. If it doesn't move, then here, there you are. And now focus with your fine focus on something up here. So whatever you choose it to be, focus on it. And now we're going to close that eye and go to the other one. We'll use the focusing mechanism on the eye piece to bring this eye into exactly the same plane of focus. So with this eye get that thing focused exactly the same as what you had in the other um, eye. And then that will prevent those headaches from happening. That's one last little thing about you can have fun with. With this microscope, just to point it out to you, this is a trinocular head. 
the, this head goes to the port to put this into the um, projector. You have to remember to open the port that uh, allows light, part of your light is going to be going to your projector. So notice I close this down, there's no picture. Now I'm going to open this up. Half uh, part of my light is coming to my eyepiece and part is going to your um, camera. So you can open it up all the way, you get a little more light to your camera, a little less to your eyes, to where you want to set it. So you just got to remember to open it up. Now, I think we've got it all done. Have I called out all the names of all the pieces? It is in your um, manual, all the names for all the pieces. Starting at the top, eye pieces, you can pull them in and out. At the end, we're going to adjust them. Then again, up here contains um, you know, the camera port. This, where the objectives sit and rotates, is called the nose piece. And the objective lens sits on that. We have the stage with the stage holder. We have our movement mechanism up and down, left and right. Usually it's on the right hand side. A few microscopes they have a review. It's reversed, but most microscopes that's on the right. So then um, um, we have our coarse focus, the big knob, our fine focus, the smaller one here. Condenser focus, this is our condenser, and you'll notice on our condenser is our iris diaphragm. So now I've opened up my iris diaphragm all the way, and look at it, it's really hard to see things. Lots of things are kind of fuzzy, it's hard to resolve because we don't have the shadows. It's kind of like going on taking a satellite above the Earth and taking a picture of the surface of the Earth at high noon. Poor, it's hard to resolve things. You would say there's not all that many bacteria in there. There's you know, not all that much in that picture. But now, take that satellite and wait until 2 o'clock in the afternoon when everything's got shadows. And all of a sudden you go, wait, that's a train station. And there's a couple of trains in there, and there's all these cars in the parking lot, and there's human beings running around, and there's a couple of big buildings. But these shadows are very important for us to try to see things. So watch as I close this down, and I start to shadow. Look at all the stuff that's actually in that field of view. And that has been the problem with a lot of people who say, oh no, you can't really see anything with a microscope. Because they aren't using the method that, um, the equipment that they thought. You have to remember the shadow. So when you're looking at something and it seems awful fuzzy and it's difficult, uh, remember to focus your condenser and then shut down that iris diaphragm. And you know, where is the best wet place? Where does it shadow the best for you? So a lot of times you want to just be kind of playing with this as you start looking at things through your microscope. So Lay around with your eyes on your Whoop, they're going to slip it. Yeah, fast and they're, they're kind of hard to catch when you're when you're um, at this high magnification. So it's it was nice smooth movement. It wasn't bumbling at all, so most likely it's silly. Nice to capture him and
says this stuff is anaerobic. Yeah, it's anaerobic. And then probably anaerobic bacteria and um, not a really desirable thing. So now we put water into that sample and maybe it's all anaerobic sitting there, even though it was open to the air. Um, but this is a great demonstration of, of cilia. Yeah, just going round and round. See you all. Uh, well, he's not eating 10,000 bacteria today in order to stay alive. See all the little grainy things inside of him? And uh, he just pooped. You know what I'm Just pooped him. So that little blob right there, he just pooped. Yeah. Little uh, plant available nutrient just got kind of release. But, you know, count all the bacteria inside. Well, talk about an impossibility. But, shoot all over the place if there's so much bacteria around them. Because they don't necessarily like these bacteria. They are very big. Yeah. Not, yeah. They don't like kelp. They want chart. Um, they, they only eat iceberg. You know, and another species only eats uh, ridiculous. Yeah. When, you know, so they are very big. You know, this guy is well, happy. He's he's checking them all out. You can oh, see where checking them out. He pulls them in, and then a lot of them he spits right back out. Yeah, he doesn't take them in. He's very big. And that little bacteria got rejected. And your bump up. Uh, there was what he liked, but didn't you see a job for it. So, can you imagine how much time you're going to sit and watch this? I'm addicting you all. Bring an understanding of the stuff that's going on. And so now when you're looking at your bacteria, you know, we've got some little rod shape, two rod, small rod shape things together. Another couple little rods, coxide, 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 littler coxide. So all the diversity of bacteria in here is, is pretty good. That's quite nice. And then we got a cilia, so it just makes you know we stored it um, between. Uh, I think this is pretty old, right? I think. Because this is stuff you used for a while ago for the terrace. Yeah, yeah. We need yeah. some way more. When did we get one? The ones that we have. And we picked it up from out there near the taro field. It was very dry. So when we put it into that plastic bag, we added a lot of water. We tried to leave it open so it could breathe. But it looks like we restricted the oxygen movement. So. That may be why we don't have really the greatest fungi in here because we set up conditions. So hopefully in your samples, we'll see things that are much, much better. So now, you're taking a look, a look at this strand, and remember, you have to focus along it. Hello, Celia. Uh, goodbye, Celia. And notice that we, as we're focusing along, we've got to get the edges nice and sharp and in focus. So this, on our Here's our microscope slide. This strand of hypha is sitting at an angle. So it's going from the bottom of our sample up through that volume up to where the cover slip is. And so we've got to focus along it. It's so only where the edges are really, really sharp. So we've got to move all the way along and say, is this uniform diameter all the way along? And the answer is yes. Now, where it branches, we've got this cute little branch here. Notice that the branch is not necessarily the same diameter as the height of from which it branches. Perfectly fine. We want to move on this and make sure that that's uniform diameter. Yep, it is. So this is definitely <laughs> a fungus. Now we want to assess what color is it. And really, if you want to do a good job on doing color, you got to look through your microscope because the color is not getting transferred out there. This is a really light tan color, but at least it's color. Yeah, it's so nice. it's not a bad color. Here he is over there. No, he's not camera shy, <laughs> which is unusual. But uh, notice too that we've got cross walls. There's a cross wall right there. These are also called septa. In the world of Latin, septa. In the world of American, language, cross walls, it's what, now that we don't need you anymore, there's going to be a billion of them over here. Cross wall there, there's another cross wall there. As we keep going down, we'll we find another, yep, there's another cross wall. 
So very uniform cross walls is, has to be the fungus. You've got uniform cross walls where at real uniform distances you're picking up a cross wall. This is a basidia waste seed. Some of the best, some of the most plant protective species that you want to talk about, especially if they're taller. It would be better if it was wider diameter. But I'm not concerned about this fungus being a problem. This is a good guy. Even though he's kind of narrow and we really like to have him and have more color, but he's definitely on the side of the guy. So this is nice. Now let's keep moving. And we're going to focus on this bit right there. Now look how narrow diameter this is. It is uniform as I go along it. But when I'm looking, when I'm right in focus, edges are real nice and sharp there. I can't see any space between the cell wall on this side and the cell wall on that side. I can't see any empty space. It's just uniform color, uniform density, which means this is not a fungus. This is an actinobacteria. Nice little aggregate, lots of that. How would you like to count the bacteria in that aggregate? Is that because there's no oxalates? No, this is just an actinobacteria. But you said that, that space, what is it that you're saying you're not seeing? Is that something that is present? Well, because the diameter of fungi has to be two or greater. Okay. And so when you can't really see any space in there, you, you're dealing with a very narrow diameter. And now, what is the diameter on this thing? Well, go find your little bacteria and you realize that this is that diameter. So this is too narrow to be a fungus. It has to be an active bacteria. But that's a pretty good way to determine. If you can't see any space between one side and the other, it's got to be real narrow. Can actinobacteria branch? Yes, bacteria, actinobacteria can branch. So now, decide for yourself. Is this a good guy fungus? What's its diameter? Yes. Yep, in your um in your handouts you've got um, for bacteria, all the sizes and shapes and considerations, and I gotta go through them all. And uh, and then for fungi. So when we're looking at this fungal hypha, find a place where the edges are nice and sharp. And now what's the diameter on this? Well, there's your smallest bacteria. How many of those bacteria will it take to go across here? And 2.5 is what I would say. Because, you know, that really if you're going to, so like one, two and a half, maybe three, but two and a half is what I would say. You just measure between the dark? Between the dark side, sides. Yeah, because you know, there's some fuzziness on this stuff. So, pretty good fungus. Maybe not the best. There's a flagellus. Keep going. Keep getting in focus. That is the fun part. Where are you going to go? You ever slow them down? Um, if you really need to slow things down, like if you didn't catch the sideways motion. Remember how that flagellate was moving through here? It was definitely bumbling. So that allows you to say that that's a that's flagellate. Did you have a little aggregate, lots of little bacteria bouncing around. Some of those bacteria are strong enough, they can push that aggregate, and the aggregate may tumble and move when you're looking at it, but it's just the bacteria that are pushing. It's a little difficult. Sometimes it takes some patience. I don't know whether you're living in the same guy twice. Yeah. This is why you don't want to take too long. Isn't that cute? This is a piece of pollen. So can you imagine when you leave this in? What is that going to do to your nasal lining? Yeah, nasty. Some of all of this is really knife like and really unpleasant. So, I'm going to find my actual sample. Now, things just bounce around just back to you. See how some things. 
these are pushing in the breeze. My sandals start to dry out here, so I may mean, just exploring, trying to some things. So, um, diameter on this one? Real narrow. So, what is it? You know, you got to focus. you got to look at the part that's actually in focus. It's an active look at you see some lamp in the silver before, but...
put that in the equation. So I did my cover slip back and forth and then just dropped it onto the slide. And now we don't have to fuss anymore about the plastic going underneath the holder. When I start this, I'm going to go into the upper right hand corner. So if you think of your microscope slide, cover slip, I'm going to go up here and just pick a field to look at. Not fair to be looking through here with your eyeballs and picking a field that's got lots of good stuff. <laughs> so you got to just be looking down here, spin field. There we are. Go check your uh, mag. Um, make sure that you're in focus. Now we're going to go up. And uh, there we are. This is a new sample, but it's still the eyeballs. And I'm going to just check my uh, condenser and make sure that that hasn't gotten out of whack, that I haven't hit something. So there we are, we're in focus. And now we're up to our 40x mingle. Wasn't that fast? Doesn't take much time. And yeah, you want to wanna practice. And I'm hoping you all will get a few more microscopes here today so that so you'll all get some practice on doing this. That's not a microscope. For, in the box? That's a, like, 4.5. 4. Okay, so just have to use scope. So yeah. we want a compound microscope. Okay, so now here's our first field. And, you know, first off, there's a fair amount of bacteria. So we're going to wait to count our bacteria before we go up higher in dilution. So uh, now we're, so that's bacterium. See how it, that bacterium, when it's moving, tends to go in one direction and then turn around and turn around and be sharp. So molar bacterium is a different species. There are the ciliate. Did you see them over in the corner? So now we record a ciliate for this field. Um, we've got, what we've got to decide is that a fungal hypha? Or are those actinobacteria? And because when I'm in focus on them, I can't see space between. They're both. So I would put a strand of actinobacteria because I think that's pretty much the same here. And here's another one, another strand. So we've got another actino. we got a little bit of something here, but actino at best. Flatulent? See them right there? Bouncing around, so now we would reward one flatulent in this field. We've got this, we got to really focus in on them and decide what diameter this amount of it is. You know, so we got another um, actinobacteria. So, Probably what we're looking at is a bacterium getting real pushy. And it's just pushing that whole little aggregate because I don't see a. Here goes flashlight. See how he's bubbling? That rear end was going, we don't want that light on. The TU. Um, so we've got two flashlights in this field. Now here's another actinobacterium. They're on diameter, so we've got a whole load of actinos in here. Here's another one. So we've seen good actinos, we have a lot of bacteria, we've got to have a flesh. Oh, there's a ciliate. Whoa. So, how many ciliates is that in this field? Two. Okay, so we're done counting that one. We record all of this data. We then want to move on to the next field of view, and all I'm going to do is go down. So here's my slide, here's my cover slip. We started here, and I'm just going to move down a not going to be able to through the microscope because I know I will, be, I will choose a field that's got the most interesting stuff in it. So you can't be looking. Close your eyes, something. So here's my next field of view. We're going to start counting. So, mm, not a line of pieces. I can't tell if this is a regular bacterium or it's an actino. So just ignore it. So searching through here, we just got lots of bacteria. This is a fungal sport. There was a flagellate. There. So one flagellate is one or five. Fungal score, you can record them if you want, but we don't count them in our fungal 
determination because we're interested in organisms that are doing something. So, no, it's not part of total fungus. Uh, you might, if you want to have a category spores, go ahead and put in a fungal category spore and they'll like one little brown guy. And that's about all I've seen in this field. We've got lots of that. Oops, there goes a second flag up there's a third. Wait long enough, can you get four? <laughs> So you can see where you, you want to keep your count team down to you know, kind of a minimum, or you can keep accumulating on them, but you've gotten in here, so this is great. So, so now let's go to our next field. I mean, are you supposed to spend like 30 seconds on a field? Because if you stay there, you can see lots of seconds on it, yeah? Yeah, so try to keep it down to the time it takes you to count the stuff that's in the field. I don't try to time it in any way. Because if there's absolutely no flagellates or protozoa in here, you'll never see them. So let's pick up a few things that are in here. If they're going to come smooth and by, we have to have a pretty good number in here. So, and remember, this is a qualitative assessment. It is not an absolute quantitative assessment. So lots of things jiggling. I guess it must be my elbows. Oops, there we're a flagellant. So we got a flagellant. Uh, we got one, two, we got two actinos in here. They would count this as just a piece of stuff. See how it's kind of lumpy and bumpy? There was another flagellant. The flagellants tend to be smaller than cilia. They tend to be, but there are some very small cilia, and there are some very large flagellants. So you really do want to be looking for that motion. You want to be looking for the wall. Still no fungi. We haven't picked up any fungi at all. So that was field three, so let's go on to field four. Just continue. Just moving down. Yep, I'm just moving down. I will do five, you know, my cover stick here. I will do five fields here, and then I'll move over. Do five fields up, move over, do five fields down, move over, do five fields up. If I feel the need to do that many fields. So flash that right away, bumbling happily right all the way along. You have a spore there, you have an actino, probably a piece of pollen. Yeah, and that's it. We just got lots of bacteria, but we'll count them in a later dilution. So what um, we're doing as we go through each field is we're just looking for absence or presence. But yeah, we're looking for presence. We're going to record the things that we see in this field. Hopefully we'll run into some fudge out here soon. Let's just see stuff. So fungal hypha. Hmm. It might have been a fungal hypha once upon a time, but it looks kind of mashed and beat up and you know, so there's a that that looks real fungal, but then you know, it's got kind of smashed, smooshed. I can't quite convince myself that that's the fungal hypha and not just a few strand of organic stuff. So, actino. Stuff. Um, nice bacteria. Woohoo! Cilia, one or five. See this, and that's probably the same guy, so I'm not going to count them twice. So, this bacteria right there, one is what I'm looking at. So we've got a nice rod shape bacteria. Let's add that to our list of um, good of diversity of bacteria that we're seeing in this sample. Uh, too short a piece, you know, not long enough for me to count that as a fungus. Could be something else, another flagellate. So that was field number five or four. 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 So we'll go a little more. Looking for move that maybe that's an amoeba. Nope. No museum. Do you see any strands of anything? Nope. Not seeing any strands. So you see why we got into a number of fields. Flash one. There it goes. Actino. There's a real skin one right there. Do you ever put uh, drugs on your slide to slow the guys down? Um, if I need to slow them down for some reason. Um, I will take my slide off of my stage. I will flip my cigarette lighter 
or light a candle or a Bunsen burner, and you pass your slide through that flame like five or six times, and then put that slide right back on here, and you should be on the same field of view, and hopefully that critter is now slowed down. Because that was another flag to the eyes. So, moving over, flagellants, wins, ectino, ectino, and that's it. Um, maybe wait a few more seconds in case the flagellant or silly come along by, check for oozing, the needy. So, going up. There's a uh, actino. Silly. <laughs> oh, oops. Uh, I think we got two in there. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just get a little problematical when, when every once in a while. When they go that fast, how do you know they're between flagellants and silly? It's just the size? Just the size. And the fact that they're not bumbling in any way as they go zooming through. Right. Even fast flagellants will still bumble. Sideways. Okay. There's always that sideways motion when we're doing the flagellants. So let's go on to the next field. Well, there's a story. We got him fairly slim. So, lots of bacteria. Flags in here. No, easy. Yeah, okay, there's a flagellate. So, one flagellate, one. It's probably bumbling. So, I'm going to get back in the focus. Where are you? So, that guy right there. No, it was something that went zoom. A little bit of sideways motion. I can't really identify the flagellate or silly. But, you know, we got one. Next field, with a nice strand up here, and focus on it nice and sharp. No, he's out of focus, I can see his face, but that's out of focus. So when, he, when he's really sharpest in focus, it's an actino once again. There's not picking up any sunshine. So, do you think we've seen enough fields in the sample that have a pretty good idea of what's going on here? We could do a quick scan. Let's go back to our format. And let's just scan the whole slide and see if we can see any nematodes. So, I'm going to go find my corner and then just scan across. Make sure you just have lots of eggs. You know, there is probably a good fungus. You did not, you know, to do. Too random in there. Yeah, this is still the IOS for the tarot pad. So it's a little bit old, we wet it up, and it was a nice big silliness of the silliness in there. Big arms. So, you know, a lot of times if you just really want a, a quick and dirty, um, you know, just scanning it this man gives you a real good idea. You have to go up in higher man to uh, determine whether the strands that you're seeing here are actino or whether they are really fungi. And you probably want to go up in mag when you see some of the little zoomers in there and make sure is that a flatulent or is that a cilia. So he's a little hard to tell because there's a little bit of the sideways bubble in there. So I want to go up in there. I'm not going to talk about this right now. I'm not going to talk about the first sample of this that we have. There were like three nematodes in it. Where are you? These strands, um, they um, probably are organic matter because see how it's bigger at this end and then it gets real narrow down here. Uh, probably just you know root material. See how this is tattered and torn up here. Why don't I never do that? Now that's probably a root. That's probably silly. That one, I think that's probably flatulent. He's going sideways. And so it's a little hard at this low band. 
pick out that sign of motion, so we really want to go up in magnification. And nematode populations are so much more variable that you know one sample will have five or six, and then you'll get five or six samples with nothing in them. Sometimes nematodes cluster together. They do tend to cluster. Mom has babies, and they all hang around the same food source. Spoons, 
They were like, I want my one gram of sample at the bottom and fill it up to 10 mils. And my thumb just perfectly sits in the top of that medicine spoon. And now I can shake. It makes it really easy. If you get two or three of those little medicine spoons, then you can take um, one mil out of that, the first medicine spoon, put it in the next one, and add your next 10 mils. You've got your one to 100 dilution. One mil out of that gives your next medicine spoon, add 10 mils, or nine mils of water. Shake it, you've got your one to 1,000 dilution. So now you can easily go back and do your bacteria counts. So with these test tubes, I'm going to have to push that with my thumb and now shake for about three seconds and hope I don't spill all my sample out across the floor. Where do you get the medicine spoon? Usually from a pharmacy. You have to go to a drugstore or something, they usually have those medicine spoons. Sometimes they're kind of funky about it, you actually have to buy some you know, cough syrup or something in order to get the medicine spoon. You can order them online. So you know, you want to think about that for the taking your to get a whole bunch of those. How long do you shake it? 30 seconds. So that was 30 seconds. So now I have this, this other cute little pipette. I'll rinse it out. And this is a real easy way to get my drops. Now typically when I'm doing this pipette, I'm going to pull up a sample, blow it out. So all of the bacteria that are in my sample start uh, colonizing the plastic walls of the pipette and I'm not going to kind of underestimate my bacterial count because I lose some of the walls. You know, once I get done taking the sample, I'm going to want to wash my pipette out. You see how this is trying to get plugged up. So yeah, it can be a little fun. Thank you. 
those who have been recording. So I just don't think it makes that much difference. If you ever think you might want to do some staining, you might keep it on the next. Do you really want to keep the closer? I mean, the, you want the intermediate 10 because you want to focus your condenser. Yeah, four and ten minutes. There's a ten, so there's a four, a ten, and a forty, and one hundred. Um, we just don't need to use the one hundred because we're looking at all of these. There he is. See him? Nematode. This guy's a baby. They're all small like this. Um, so now we want to identify him. So we're going to go after our ten x objective. That intermediate one, because it's way easier to focus on him step at a time than to try to jump straight from our four to our forty. Oftentimes you need him. You want to make sure he's in the center of your field. So now when we switch over to our forty, he's right there for us. So now this might be the situation where you get your um, your heater your because he is moving. He is very camera shy. But as he, when he slows down, every once in a while when he's moving, you can kind of get a um, look at that mouth part. And um, it's just a simple stoma. It's just a, as you don't hear the knobs are so big on most root ears that you would pick them out. But we might want to, when we get done looking at everything else here, Bacteria. So, yep, he is probably eating those bacteria. And again, all of these organisms are very picky about exactly which ones. So, and I'm, you know, people just do not understand the the dynamics, the energy dynamics of nematodes. Because you, we pick these out of the liquid, but we don't store them for a year in liquid cultures where there are no bacteria, there are no fungi. But we'll come back in a year and they're still wiggling like this. So explain to me how they stay alive. There's got to be something about their energy consumption that we do not understand. So, what about oxygen? What about oxygen? Didn't you say that that's why the oxygen, that's why the other one was shooting towards the edge and trying to get out, trying to yeah, you know, they do. They are aerobic organisms, except for the root feeders. The root oh. feeders do just fine in anaerobic conditions. <laughs> yeah. So that's something that's not well understood. That how they yeah. stay in that dormancy. Yeah. Does that happen? Does he attack the cat? Does he get that thing attached? Definitely attacks the cat. He will carry things on the surface of his skin. And he'll also eat things that pass right through that he doesn't actually digest. And so he's leaving those all behind. When I show you my um, slides from today, I'll show you um, one that carries fungi with it. Now see this organism here? See how it's a shell? And on this end there's an opening right here. This is a testate amoeba. And inside where you see all of that um, Cytoplasm material, there's the amoeba in there. Now we just finished shaking him up. His whole world has been like swash, swash, swash. So he has retreated inside that test, inside the shell that he built. Because it's just too scary to be out and active in the, the soil right now. So he's hiding out back in here. So a little bit of these, the bacterial material in to protect him. <coughs> Every time that nematode hits him, he's going, wow, scary things out there. I'm not going to go outside for a long time. So we're looking at this. It's in a bacteria. So we got um, actino in that sample. But let's keep, let's go on back to our um, forex. See if we don't have some other nematodes in here. They're not waking us so much. There's a flagellum, because he's happy bumbling. I think so. Um, you know, if we come back now, you know, but I don't think he's going to calm down any time in the near future. He doesn't like the fact that his whole world has been shaken.
that's the green button. Um, they can, you can see those at, you know, in another one here. So your pineapple field is recently been in forest. And testate amoebae, so there's another one. Testate amoebae um, are known to uh, preserve <coughs> old growth forest soil. Can you say that? Uh, it's just Prefer old growth. Prefer old growth. Now, old growth forests, um, so, you know, they tend to have to be a couple hundred years old for them to be called old growth. There's our nematode from last time. We slowed down a little bit, but no. So, there's another one. So it might be a little easier to see, so let's go up in the bag. Remember the glues the bacteria make? Mm -hmm. His tail is stuck in some of that glue. Put this in here. That's why he's scratching it. He's trying to get out. Let me go, let me go. Let me go, I'll eat you. So bacterial fever, I don't see anything. <laughs> So in that, you know, that end of his body moves out, you can see that there's not anything other than just kind of straight stoma at that end. Again, we could come back and heat the slide and really look at what's in his mouth part later on. So we got two nematodes in the sample. Do we Per sample. Per, um, yeah, per slide that you prepared. And remember, that's just two drops that are on here. So it's a number of nematodes in two drops. And so when we get to the spreadsheet, we'll go through that. And that's one of the problems with those plastic. Um, plastic scratches so easily. I don't know how many of you have ever had plastic glasses on your glasses. They scratch so easy. Thank you. 
sizes. We have some really small cocci. We have a little bit larger cocci. We have a little bit bigger. Gonna score something there. We've got a rod shaped bacterium down there. So it's pretty good diversity. We've got more than six different kinds of bacteria, but we're a little lacking on the rod end of things. There's a little rod shaped bacterium right there, but they're a little bit lacking in them. So you know, a little improvement there would be good. Now we have a strand of, is this fungus or is this actinobacteria? So you can differentiate this side from that side. There is clearly a space in the middle there. What's its color? It's a nice dark brown. So what's the diameter then? Two. I put it down there at two. So um, probably a good guy, but not the best. Now, let's see, any flagellates. So, we're now with this field, can you say? We'll count bacteria when we um, do the higher evolutions. So, let's go on to the next field. We have bacteria. Look at that. You see any actinos? Not 
doing anything right now. There's Lacto and Silas in here, and lots of little cops eye. But, you know, what would you suspect would be the reason in this lineup is, though, that they're not getting really good production and where they probably have some diseases? No, no, no. We need We need for So what? How could nutrients be siphoned in the soil? Who's releasing them from your bacteria and fungi? Do we have bacteria? Yes. Who's releasing those nutrients from the bacterial population? Nobody. <laughs> the protozoa are flagellates, amoebae, and ciliates. Yeah. So another fungal spore. I don't know, you know, how much do you have to actually quantify these samples? Do we really care that our bacteria are up here at you know, a couple hundred million per gram? You're getting the important information, don't you think? So, yeah, you can go all ballistic and quantify, but you no, know, it's a pain in the butt to have to do that. We can't, no, in, in this kind of preparation, the morphology of that bacteria, doesn't it look like it's the same as that one? No, probably not. No, and we're just not going to be able to distinguish all 75,000 of those different species of bacteria using morphological characteristics. So we have to do DNA analysis if you really want to put names on them. Is it really important to put names on them? All the other things in this sample are telling you that it's good in aerobic, then so you got a billion different or a million different bacterial aerobic bacterial species. You know what we need to know. You know, if we're trying to, you know, what bacteria are strongly associated with strawberry, then we have to identify the species and we better have that DNA ability. Um, there's a test state amoeba. So now we've got an amoeba in this picture. So we've got to add those into our list. Put the map. See those cute? See that back here? You went zoom, zoom. Come on, zoom, zoom. move. Again, we'll just sit there. They'll probably just take off again. I don't know see them. But that is a bacteria. See how small he is? There was another one there. So we got some multiple bacteria up here in that, that corner. Which is, you know, that's a good thing. It's different species. There you go. See them go? They're coming back. But they tend to do this straight back and forth kind of thing. It's really trying to keep them in focus. So, that means that it's more viable. No, it just means that that species is <coughs> it's a, a characteristic of that species. So I, I suspect there was more to learn here, but um, you know, it's going to take more observation and more information to really pick out is it good or bad to be vulnerable. So we got a spore. Just have bacteria acting on. An amoeba oozes. An amoeba is actually going to be oozing along. And they're not going to have an amoeba something around. So you've got a strand of something, but uh, I'll guess. I'm moving over. I'm not quite sure what you're doing a reading, but no one works. So now, right there, yep, it is a fungus, but look at how narrow diameter and how it is. Uh, what kind of fungus is it? The only fungi we have in the sample are disease causing fungi. Yeah. Um, what is that coil thing? There? Uh, that was a scratch on the last oh. of our lens, yeah. of our um, cover slip. So I'm exiting that cover slip, not for you to So, actinobacteria, we got lactobacillus, there's a testate amoeba. Those testate amoeba are probably left over from the forest that they tore down to plant this pineapple. What about they could be from um, the medium that was used in the compost that was uh, mushroom medium? Yep, it could. Well, so if you so this is why you would want to talk to your client and find out exactly what they have done in the past because you're exactly correct. No 
those steps say maybe you could become a little compost they put on there. So I, I might be making you know, a wrong assumption. Oh no, I made an ass out of you and me. Assumption is bad. So I don't know how many more you want to come in the fields. I think we've kind of got this thing figured out, don't you? Uh, you at least have spectrum. We can have toads in here. But we don't have any good guy fungi. We really don't have any good guy, too many good guy for so At least we didn't have any cynics. So. There's pain around. Toys. Yeah, at least. There's not many food that to indicate that it's really bad error. So next sample, do we want to do one more before we break or do you want to break right now? Do you want one more? Mm -hmm. Anytime you want to watch that break, go ahead and tell them next time. Typically, or they're large enough that, that you'll be able to see them. 
it's almost nematode shaped, but nematodes are really clear. Some of the cars in their body is typically clear. Uh, Mine are for cod hair. So anything with real broad at this end and sharpens to a point, it's got to be something off of my car. So it does say you probably have my car pods in here as well, which is good. That's a good thing.
But if you was, I'd be going, ah, ah, let's get this up to your feet again. So just a thing I want to point out to all of you. So, so far we, we got bacteria, we got lactobacillus, uh, testicula, but you know, not seeing really good fungi. Spore.
on the next field dog comes into view. And there in the middle of the field is this little round face with these two black, dark ears on it, eyes, nose, and smiley mouth. And you go, Mickey Mouse. In the middle of the eye, they've been working to yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 